my dear young friend, said Father Time as he laid his hand gently upon my shoulder. You are entirely wrong. I looked up over my shoulder from the table at which I was sitting and I saw him. But I had known or felt for at least a half hour that he was standing somewhere near me. You have not... I do not doubt, good reader, had more than once that strange, uncanny feeling that there is someone unseen standing beside you in a darkened room, let us say, with a dying fire, when the night has grown late and the October wind sounds low outside, and when, through the thin curtain that we call reality, the unseen world starts for a moment clear upon our dreaming sense. You have had it. Yes, I know you have. Oh, never mind telling me about it. Stop. No, I don't want to hear about that strange presentiment you had the night before your Aunt Eliza broke her leg. Don't let's bother with your experience. I want to tell mine. You are quite mistaken, my dear young friend, said Father Time. Quite wrong. Young friend, I said, my mind as one's mind is apt to in such a case, running to an unimportant detail. Why do you call me young? Your pardon. He answered gently. He had a gentle way with him, had Father Time. The fault is my failing eyes. I took you at first sight for something under a hundred. Under a hundred? I expostulated. Well, I should think so. Your pardon again. The fault is my failing memory. I forgot. You seldom pass that nowadays, do you? Your life is very short of late. I heard him breathe a wistful, hollow sigh. Very ancient and dim he seemed as he stood beside me. But I did not turn to look upon him. I had no need to. I knew his form, in the inner and clearer sight of things, as well as every human being knows by innate instinct the unseen face and form of Father Time. I could hear him murmuring beside me. Short, short. Your life is short. The sound of it seemed to mingle with the measuring ticking of a clock somewhere in the silent house. Then I remembered what he'd said. How do you know that I'm wrong? I asked. And how can you tell what I was thinking? You said it out loud. But it wouldn't matter. Anyway, you said that Christmas was all played out and done with. Yes, I admitted. That's what I said. And what makes you think that? He questioned, stooping, so it seemed to me, still further over my shoulder. Why, I answered, the trouble is, I've been sitting here for hours, sitting till goodness only knows how far into the night, trying to think out something to write for a Christmas story. And it won't go. It can't be done. Not in these awful days. Hey. Christmas story. You see, Father Time, I explained, glad with a foolish little vanity of my trade to be able to tell him something that I thought enlightening. All the Christmas stuff, stories and jokes and pictures, is all done, you know, in October. I thought this would have surprised him, but I was mistaken. Dear me, not till October. What a rush. How ah, well I remember the ancient Egypt, as I think you call it, seeing them getting out their Christmas things, all cut in hieroglyphics, always two or three years ahead. Two or three years, I exclaimed. <laughs> that was nothing. And why, the Babylonians, they used to get their Christmas jokes ready, all baked in clay, a whole solar eclipse ahead of Christmas. They said, I think, uh, the, the public preferred it that way. Egypt, I said. Babylon. <laughs> but surely, Father Time, there was no Christmas in those days. I thought... My dear child. 
he interrupted gently. Don't you know that there always has been a Christmas? I was silent. Father Time moved across the room and stood beside the fireplace, leaning on the mantelpiece. The little wreaths of smoke from the fading fire seemed to mingle with his shadowy outline. Well, he said presently, What is it that's wrong with Christmas? Why, I answered, all the romance, the, the joy, the beauty of it has been gone crushed and killed by the greed of commerce and the horrors of war. I'm not, as you thought I was, a hundred years old, but I can conjure up, as anybody can, a picture of Christmas in the good old days of a hundred years ago. The quaint, old-fashioned houses, <laughs> standing deep among the evergreens, with the light twinkling from the windows on the snow the warmth and comfort within, the great fire roaring on the hearth, the merry guests grouped about in its blaze and the little children with their eyes dancing in the Christmas firelight, waiting for Father Christmas in his fine mummery of red and white and cotton wool to hand the presents from the yuletide tree. <laughs> I can see it, I added, as if it were yesterday. It was but yesterday, said Father Time, and his voice seemed to soften with the memory of bygone years. I remember it well. Ah, I continued, that was Christmas indeed. Give me back such days as those, with the good old cheer, the old stagecoaches and the gabled inns and the warm red wine, the snapdragon and the Christmas tree, and I'll believe again in Christmas. Yes, in Father Christmas himself. Believe in him, said Time quietly. <laughs> you may well do that. He happens to be standing outside in the street at this moment. Outside? I exclaimed. Well, why don't he come in? He's afraid to. He's frightened that he dare come in unless you ask him. May I call him in? I signified assent. And Father Time went to the window for a moment and beckoned into the darkened street. Then I heard footsteps. Clumsy and hesitant they seemed upon the stairs. And in a moment a figure stood framed in the doorway. A figure of Father Christmas. He stood shuffling his feet with a timid, apologetic look upon his face. But how changed he was. I'd known in my mind's eye from childhood up the face and form of Father Christmas, as well as that of old time himself. Everybody knows, or once knew of him, a jolly little rounded man with a great muffler wound about him, a packet of toys on his back, and with such merry twinkling eyes and rosy cheeks as are only given by the touch of the driving snow and the rude fun of the north wind. Why, there was once a time, not yet so long ago, when the very sound of his sleigh bells sent the blood running warm to the heart. But now, how changed. All draggled with the mud and rain he stood, as if no house had sheltered him these three years past. His old red jersey was tattered in a dozen places. His muffler frayed and ravelled, the bundle of the toys that came with him was wet and torn in a net. The cardboard boxes gaped asunder. There were boxes among them, I vow, that he must have been carrying these past three years. But most of all, I noted the change that had come over the face of Father Christmas. The old, brave look of cheery confidence was gone. The smile that had beamed responsive of the laughing eyes of countless children around unnumbered Christmas trees was there no more. And 
in the place of it. <laughs> there showed a look of timid apology, of apprehensiveness, as of one who's asked in vain the warmth and shelter of a human home. Such a look as the harsh cruelty of this world has stamped upon the faces of its outcasts. And so stood Father Christmas, shuffling on the threshold, fumbling his poor tattered hat in his hand. Shall I come in? He said, his eyes appealingly on Father Time. Come. He said time. He turned to speak to me. Your room is dark. Turn up the lights. He's used to light, bright light, and plenty of it. The dark has frightened him these three years past. I turned up the lights, and the bright glare revealed all the more cruelly the tattered figure before us. Father Christmas advanced, a timid step across the floor. Then he paused, as if in sudden fear. Is this floor mine? He said. No, no. Said Time soothingly. And to me he added in a murmured whisper. He's afraid. He was blown up in a mine in no man's land between the trenches at Christmas time in 1914. Broke his nerve. May I put my toys down upon that machine gun? Asked Father Christmas timidly. It will help to keep them dry. It is not a machine gun. See, it is only a pile of books upon the sofa. To me, he whispered, they turned a machine gun on him in the streets of Warsaw. I think he sees them everywhere he goes now. It's all right, Father Christmas, I said, speaking as cheerily as I could while I rose and stirred the fire into a blaze. There are no machine guns here. This is but the house of a poor writer. Ah, said Father Christmas, lowering his tattered hat still further and attempting something of a humble bow. A writer? Are you Hans Anderson, perhaps? <laughs> oh, not quite, I answered. But a great writer, I do not doubt, said the old man, with a humble courtesy that he had learnt, it may well be centuries ago, in the yuletide season of his northern home. The world owes much to its great books. I carry some of the greatest with me always. I have them. Here. He began fumbling among the limp and tattered packages that he carried. Look, the house that Jack built, a marvellous, deep thing. And this, babes in the wood. Will you take it, this, a poor present? but present still. Not so long ago, I gave them in thousands every Christmas time. No one wants them now. He looked appealingly towards Father Time, as the weak may look towards the strong for help and guidance. None want them now, he repeated, and I could see the tears start in his eyes. Why is it so? Has the world forgotten its sympathy with the lost children wandering in the wood? All the world, I heard Time murmur with a sigh, is wandering in the world. But out loud, he spoke to Father Christmas in cheery admonition. Tut tut, good Christmas, but you must cheer up. Hmm? Here. Sit in this chair, the biggest one, so, and um, beside the fire. Let us stir it to a blaze. Hmm? More wood, that's better. And, and listen, good old friend, to the wind outside. Almost a Christmas wind, is it not? Hmm? Merry and boisterous enough for all the evil times it stirs among. Old Christmas seated himself beside the fire, 
his hands outstretched towards the flames. Something of his old-time cheeriness seemed to flicker across his features as he warmed himself at the blaze. That's better. I was cold, miss. Cold. Chilled to the bone. Of old I never felt it so. No matter what the wind, the world seemed warm about me. Why is it not so now? You see? Said Time, speaking in a low whisper for my ear alone. How sunk and broken he is. Will you not help? Gladly, I answered. If I can. All can, said Father Time. Every one of us. Meantime, Christmas had turned towards me a questioning eye, in which, however, there seemed to revive some little gleam of merriment. Have you, perhaps? He asked half timidly. Schnapp. Schnaps, I repeated. I schnaps. A glass of it to drink to your health might warm my heart again, I think. Ah, I said. Something to drink. His one failing, whispered Time. If it is one, forgive it him. <laughs> he used it for centuries. Give it to him if you have it. I keep a little in the house, I said reluctantly, perhaps in the case of illness. Hmm. Tut, tut. Said Father Time, as something as near as could be to a smile passed over his shadowy face. In case of illness. They used to say that in ancient Babylon. Here, let me pour it for him. Drink, Father Christmas. Drink! Marvellous it was to see the old man smack his lips as he drank his glass of liquor, neat after the fashion of old Norway. Hmm. Marvellous, too, to see the way in which, with the warmth of the fire and the generous glow of the spirits in his face changed and brightened till the old-time cheerfulness beamed again it upon it. He looked about him, as it were, with a new and growing interest. A pleasant room. And what better, sir, than a wind without and a brave fire within? Then his eye fell upon the mantelpiece, where lay among the litter of books and pipes a little toy horse. Ah! said Father Christmas, almost gaily. Children in the house. One, I answered. <laughs> the sweetest boy in all the world. I'll be bound he is, said Father Christmas, and he broke now into a merry laugh that did one's heart good to hear. Oh, 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 all our Lord bless me, the number that I have seen, each and every one, and quite right too, the sweetest child in all the world. And how old do you say? Two and a half, all but two months, except for a week. The very sweetest age of all. I bet you say, eh? What? They all do. The old man broke again into such a jolly chuckling of laughter that his snow-white locks shook upon his head. <laughs> but stop a bit. This horse is broken. Tut, tut, a hind leg nearly off. This won't do. He had the toy in his lap in a moment, mending it. Oh, it was wonderful to see, for all his age, how deft his fingers were. Time, he said. And it was amusing to note that his voice had assumed almost an authoritative tone. Uh, reach me that piece of string there. That's right. Here, hold your finger across the knot there. Now then, a bit of beeswax. What? No, beeswax? Tut, tut, how ill-supplied your houses are today. How can you mend toys without beeswax? Still, <clears throat> it will stand up now. I tried to murmur my best thanks, but Father Christmas waved my gratitude aside. Nonsense, that's nothing, that's my life. Perhaps the little boy would like a book too. 
I have them right here in my package. Here, sir. Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. <clears throat> Marvelous, deep. Oh, uh, most profound thing. I read it to myself often still. How damp it is. Pray, uh, will you let me dry my books before your fire? Oh, only too willingly, I said. How wet and torn they are. Father Christmas had risen from his chair and was fumbling among his tattered packages, taking them from his children's books, all limp and draggled from the rain and wind. All wet and torn, he murmured, and his voice sank again into sadness. I have carried them these past three years. Look! They're all for little children in Belgium and Serbia. Can I get them to them? Thank you. Time gently shook his head. But presently, perhaps if I dry and mend them. Look, some of them were inscribed already. This one you see was written with father's love. Why has it never come to him? Is it rain or tears upon the page? He stood, bowed over his little books, his hands trembling as he turned the pages. Then he looked up, the old fear upon his face again. That sound. Listen. It's guns. I hear them. No, no, I said. Only a car passing in the street below. Listen. Hear that again? Voices crying. No. No, I answered. Not voices. Only the night wind among the trees. My children's voices. I hear them everywhere. They come to me in the wind, and I see them as I wander in the night and storm. My children. Torn and dying in the trenches. Beaten into the ground. I hear them crying from the hospitals, each one to me, still as I knew him once, a little child. Time, time, he cried, reaching out his arms in appeal. Give me back my children. They do not die in vain. Time murmured gently, but Christmas only moaned in answer. Give me back my children. Then he sank down upon his pile of books and toys, his head buried in his arms. You see, his heart is breaking. And will you not help him if you can? Well, only too gladly, I replied. But what is there to do? This, said Father Time. Listen. He stood before me, grave and solemn. A shadowy figure, but half seen, though he was close beside me. The firelight had died down, and through the curtained window there came already the first dim brightening of the dawn. The world that once you knew seems broken and destroyed about you. You must not let them know. The children. The cruelty and the horror and the hate that racks the world today keep it from them. Some day he will know. Here, time pointed to the prostrate form of Father Christmas. That his children, that once were, have not died in vain. That from their sacrifice shall come a nobler, better world for all to live in. A world where countless happy children should hold bright their memory forever. But for the children of today, Save and spare them all you can from the evil, hate, horror of the war. Later they will know and understand. Not yet. Give them back their Merry Christmas. It's kind thoughts. It's Christmas charity till later on there shall be with it again peace on earth and goodwill to all men. His voice ceased. It seemed 
to vanish, as it were, in the sighing of the wind, I looked up. Father Time and Christmas had vanished from the room. The fire was low, and the day was breaking visibly outside. Let us begin, I murmured. I will mend this broken horse. The end.